Hi class, welcome to lesson nine, classifying matter part two of three. In this lesson, we are going to explore compounds. And by the end of this lesson, you should be able to differentiate between elements, compounds, and mixtures, identify a compound by formula and particle diagram, classify a compound as ionic or covalent by using the elements that make up the compound, and relate the properties of elements to compounds. Let's get started. As a review from our last lesson, we know that matter can be classified as a pure substance or a mixture. We're still going to be looking at pure substances. Now, pure substances cannot be physically separated because they are held together by bonds. Now, pure substances that are held together by bonds are compounds and pure substances that are as simple as possible are elements. We talked about elements in the last video. So today we're going to talk about compounds. So as a review again, you can see that both elements and compounds are considered pure substances because their particle diagrams only have one type of particle. Even if the particle in a compound has more than one type of element. So again, you can look at the H2O2 or hydrogen peroxide compound. And what you can notice is that every particle has two red oxygens and two white hydrogens. Or if we look at the sodium chloride, every particle has one red sodium and one blue chlorine. So remember that elements contain only one kind of atom. Those atoms can be monoatomic like helium or they could be diatomic like oxygen. So oxygen is an element where two atoms bond together but there are still only one element, the element oxygen. Versus compounds contain two or more different types of atoms so, or two or more different types of elements. So water has two hydrogens and one oxygen. In compounds, the two different atoms are going to be chemically combined or bonded. They have a fixed composition. So for instance, water is always H2O. And if you had a different composition like H2O2, you would have hydrogen peroxide. So if you change the proportion, you also change the compound. Compounds can be separated by breaking bonds. So this requires a chemical reaction to separate them. So for instance, carbon dioxide, we can use a chemical reaction to separate it into carbon and oxygen. So by now, you should be able to differentiate between elements, compounds, and mixtures. And you should be able to identify a compound by formula and particle diagram. The important thing to know about compounds is that their properties change when a bond is formed. So the properties of a compound are always unique and not related to the properties of the elements that make them up. So water, H2O, puts out fire, but it is made up of the diatomic elements oxygen, a flammable gas, and the diatomic element hydrogen, another flammable gas. So the properties of the elements are not related to the property of the compound. So this is an apparatus where we're using electricity to break the bonds that hold hydrogen and oxygen in the compound water, and we're producing the gas, hydrogen and oxygen. So other examples are that whenever you change the formula, you always change the name and you change the property in a compound. So carbon monoxide is an odorless, colorless, poisonous gas. And here you can see some of its properties, while carbon dioxide is also an odorless, colorless gas, but it's not 
highly poisonous um, to humans. That leads us to a funny joke that again tells us that when you have a different formula, you get a different name and has very different properties. So Johnny was a chemist's son, but Johnny is no more. What Johnny thought was H2O was H2SO4. So we can see that the formulas are different. So H2O we know is water and H2SO4 is actually sulfuric acid. So if you change the formula, you'll change the name water versus sulfuric acid. And then you'll change the properties. You should drink water. You should not drink sulfuric acid. Hopefully, this should lead you to ask, why do elements form compounds? Well, um, one very important theme that you'll see all throughout Regents Chemistry and all throughout basic chemistry is that elements form compounds because bonded together, they will have a lower potential energy. So when bonds are formed, potential energy goes down and energy is always released. So here you can see an example of the creation of hydrogen chloride. And when the particles go and they assemble together, they become more organized. So their potential energy or their positions decrease. Um, and in this process, the stability of the system will increase when their positions are decreased. And the reverse is also always true. So when bonds are broken, you have to put in potential energy. I always kind of remember if I want to break the bond, I have to go, hi yeah, and I have to put in energy to break that bond apart. So bond, when bonds are broken, energy must be added because the potential energy is going to increase because the positions of the atoms will also increase in the bond making process. And now you should be able to relate the properties of elements to compounds or basically understand that the properties of elements are independent of the compounds that they create. Let's take a minute to look at what are the parts in a compound formula. Compound formulas can include subscripts or these small numbers that follow an element symbol. They indicate the number of atoms only of the element that they, precedes it. So for example, H2O reminds us that we do not write ones in chemistry. So the subscripted two only applies to the hydrogen. So Water has two hydrogens and one oxygen. We don't write a subscript of one because it's unnecessary. As we, if we write an oxygen, there should be one of them. And again, when we have CO2, there's no subscript for the carbon. So the carbon, there's only one carbon because it's just understood, but there are two oxygens. So you can see here we can build. Uh, particle diagram for these compounds. So these elements are bonded together to make a compound. Now, sometimes we can have a larger number called a coefficient, and it comes in front of the formula. And that tells us the number of molecules or compound units that are in a formula. So we have three molecules of water. So if we distribute the three through, then we're actually gonna have six hydrogens and three oxygens in three water molecules. Uh, what does it mean if we have two water molecules? So here are the pictures. So you can see if we distribute this two through the formula or if we draw out two water molecules, we will actually have four hydrogens and two oxygens. I want to know how many water molecules are indicated by this formula. Again, the coefficient indicates the number of molecules or compound units. Now you should be able to identify the number of atoms and molecules in a substance based upon its chemical formula.
Now, the last thing we're going to look at is how we can determine the types of bonds between the elements in a compound. There are actually three kinds of bonds, but we're just going to focus on two of them because only two of them are found in compounds. The first kind of bond is called the covalent bond. So co means sharing and valent means valence. In a covalent bond, you're going to have the sharing of valence electrons between two nonmetals. This is because nonmetals have really similar properties, so they're going to have to compromise and share valence electrons. All elements make bonds to obtain a more stable, noble gas valence electron configuration. Now the word covalent bond always produces a substance that we call molecular. So whenever you see the word molecular, you know that we're talking about a covalent bond. Ionic bonds are different. They're between metals and nonmetals and they have different properties. So when metals and nonmetals bond, what happens is the metal cation transfers its electron to the nonmetal anion, but it's again for the same reason, to obtain a stable, low energy, noble gas valence electron configuration. Here's a chart that you should pause the video and copy down. This chart looks at the properties of the major types of bonds. Notice that today we only discussed two of the three types of bonds. We'll discuss the third type of bond later. The reason why we only discussed ionic and covalent bonds is that these are the only types of bonds found in compounds. Now there's a lot of information in this table. We will go and revisit this information several times throughout the year in different units, but it's a good idea to copy down this chart so that you have a foundation to build your learning on throughout the year. So ionic bonds produce compounds called salts, while covalent bonds produce compounds called molecules. Ionic bonds typically are between metals and nonmetals. They form when the metal cation transfers its electrons to the nonmetal anion. Covalent bonds create molecules where two nonmetals share their electrons. The nature of the elements within the bond impact the physical properties we see amongst compounds with these types of bonds. So ionic bonds have strong intermolecular forces. That means they have a strong force holding one compound particle next to its neighbor. This results in ionic compounds generally having high melting points and boiling points, and they're generally solids with hard crystalline structure at STP. One more unique physical property of ionic compounds is that in the liquid or molten state and in the dissolved or aqueous state, these substances have free-moving charges or free-moving ions, which allow them to conduct electricity. We say that ionic compounds are electrolytes when they are in the liquid state or when they're dissolved in water, which we also call the aqueous state. Now to name an ionic compound, we generally name the metal and then the nonmetal, and we change the ending to ide to signal that we are done with the compound name. So here you can see this formula is called potassium oxide. Nothing in the name indicates the subscripts of the formula. Conversely, covalent bonds have moderate to weak intermolecular forces, or again, the force that holds one molecule next to its neighbor. That means its melting points and boiling points will be much lower as they'll be easier to turn to liquids and gases. Covalent solids tend to be soft, brittle solids, but many covalent compounds are also liquids or gases at STP.
because there are no free-moving charges in covalent compounds. They never conduct electricity. They have a little bit more intricate naming scheme as prefixes are needed to indicate the subscript for each element. For covalent compounds, we use the prefix mono for one, di for two, tri for three, and tetra for four. For numbers greater than four, you can use the prefixes found on reference table P. So here you can see this formula has two nitrogen, so we'll say dinitrogen and then one oxygen, monoxide. Notice that we still end the name with the ide, as that's the signal that we've completed the name of a compound. So by now, you should be able to classify a compound as ionic or covalent based on the elements that make up the compound. So we've reached the end of lesson nine. By now, you should be able to differentiate between pure substances of elements and compounds with mixtures, identify a compound by both formula and particle diagram, classify a compound as ionic or covalent, and relate the properties of elements to the compounds that they build. Since we're at the end of this lesson, make sure that you've taken good notes. Write down any questions you have and bring them to class. We will discuss them. Complete your homework on Google Classroom, and don't forget, put your Regents Chemistry Reference Table and your non-graphing calculator back in your backpack so that you are prepared for class. I'll see you soon.